stop. <laughs> <laughs> We're back. <laughs> um, I don't even want to go into details, but um, <laughs> we're a little late. Our my chefs were a little bit behind. <laughs> the chefs had minimal assistance. So, <laughs> they didn't have much assistance, so we were a little late getting dinner, but we're here. So uh, do y'all want to go ahead? Stop. <laughs> do y'all want to go ahead and open in prayer? So, Lord, we just thank you for this time together uh, to study your word and to learn more about you and we just pray, God, that you would give us insight and understanding um, to everything that we learned and help us to retain and to be able to keep these things with us and help the dogs to be quiet. And we just thank you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. amen. They were praying, too. <laughs> they were praying and dog language. <clears throat> so we're going to go back to um, the days of Abraham and Noah and all that stuff. We're going to... Uh, first of all, you know, historians don't know how far back things go because they weren't here <laughs> for creation. <laughs> you know, so uh, so what the best thing that they can go back or go according to is, you know, like the ages that we went through. You know, so Abraham, uh, what we from what we know, the Bronze Age and the Iron Age are where the story of our patriarchs start. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob uh, were all during the Iron Age. The bronze, <clears throat> here's how you can tell the difference. Okay, well, what would uh, separate the Iron Age from the Bronze Age as far as the reason why they're called, what they're called? The weapons, are cool. Yeah, their tools. They, uh, they had discovered bronze. And so they started fashioning all their weapons and all their stuff out of bronze. And then in the Iron Age, they had discovered iron. So they were just making everything out of iron. <clears throat> so uh, in general, around 3300 BC, bronze technology was spread throughout what they called, back then in ancient history, it's called the Near East. <coughs> but it's Near East. the Near East. But the Near East became what we call the Middle East. You know, so the Middle East is the same as the Near East. <clears throat> so, <laughs> and then uh, around 1200 BC, people discovered the benefits of the use of iron. And so the period from 3300 to 2000 is the early Bronze Age. And this was considered to be the beginning of written human history. Right, full sense on a silver line. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> And then uh, in Egypt, that was the time, the era of the Great Period. The Great Periods. It the Great Pyramids. Written human history. Written human history. I actually shortened some of those answers at one point, but I guess not that one. Then you went back and changed them. <laughs> I made them longer again. <laughs> so I was telling them that, the, uh, that there was the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were back in the, they started back in the Bronze Age, and then, um, and then the Near East is what they call, now call the Middle East, you know, just back in ancient times it was called the Near East, and then uh, in around 1200 BC people discovered the benefits of the use of iron, so uh, from 3300 to 2000 is known as the Early Bronze Age, and then this was considered to be the beginning of human written human history and the early bronze age was also the era era I cannot talk to them, sorry was the era of the great pyramids <clears throat> and ancient israel was you know it was like a as you know israel's small it's tiny and um but it was strategically located where there's considered a bridge to different countries as a matter of fact, it's um, it formed a bridge connecting three continents, Asia, Africa, and Europe. So it was just right strategically there. And so there was a lot of empires that wanted to have control of Israel because, because of that, for them to be able to use their commerce, to be able to travel through, and just to have control 
of that area. And then um, <clears throat> the, there were three regions in the Near East in the ancient world. It was Mesopotamia, Egypt, and Syria, Palestine. Uh, Mesopotamia was a great stretch of land between the Euphrates and Tigris rivers and all of modern Iraq. Parts of Iran, Syria, and Lebanon make up most of the area known as Meso Mesopotamia. <clears throat> and so, Syria, and, Iran, and Iraq? Syria, yeah, Iran, Syria, and Lebanon, Lebanon. And Iraq, yeah, modern Iraq make up a large area of Mesopotamia. And Mesopotamians were considered, or the scholars of human history believe that Mesopotamia, which also included the Sumerians, you know, you hear about mm -hmm. the old Sumerian texts and stuff. Uh, they were early uh, cultivators of plants, and um, they began farming and domesticating animals and all that stuff. So they were pretty far ahead of their time, you know, back in that day. And they uh, were the ones who invented writing. You know, they would uh, take, they'd make clay, take soft clay, and they would draw pictures to make words, and uh, and then they would bake the tablets, you know, and that's how they'd have their their stuff. And they've discovered, you know, thousands of those tablets, you know, that have their writing and stuff on them. It's pretty cool. And um, oh, and just FYI, though, Sumerian, the word Sumerians meant black-headed ones. Hmm. So I don't know if it was they were dark-skinned. Or they just had dark hair, <laughs> or what? But that's what that name meant. Egypt was on the northeastern coast of Africa, along the Nile River, and um, the you know they developed Egyptian Egyptian hieroglyphics, and uh, historians believe that they probably their hieroglyphics were inspired, or you know affected by the Sumerians from this. They're called it's called cuneiform writing <laughs> is what it's called so um, the Nile of course is the dominant geographic feature of Egypt and it played a major role in their history and their culture you know the Nile River was where Moses was put and um, and it, the Nile River stretches more than 600 miles through the northeastern de deserts of Africa to the Mediterranean Sea so it's a pretty pretty big area and a uh, Egypt had the rise and call, rise and call, rise and call. <laughs> I give up. <laughs> the rise and fall of several dynasties and everything. So they, um, the periods of their imperial strength, uh, eventually, or it fell into old kingdom dynasties. There was old kingdom, middle kingdom, um, and the Egypt of the patriarchs was probably the middle kingdom which would have been the Middle Bronze Age, which would have been from like 2000 to 1550 BC. So uh, that would have been uh, when Moses, during that same time period, would have been when Moses led the Israelites out of Egypt and they'd had their exodus uh, in New Kingdom Egypt. So uh, by the time of Israel's united monarchy, which came around the time of David, uh, Egypt had lost its position as a major uh, power, major s contributor, and all that stuff. But even though it still had cultural influence, <coughs> bless you. Uh, Syria, Palestine is the area from northern bend of the Euphrates along the Mediterranean coast into the Sinai Desert, and Israel was the southernmost section of Syria, Palestine. So. Uh, they weren't the site of uh, advanced civilization at that time, early on, as more of the Mesopotamian stuff. Um, its role, its main role, was that what we were just talking about a while ago, it being a, rig, a ridge, a bridge. A bridge. I'm going to go start taking English lessons again. <laughs> um, <clears throat> so, and then I'm telling you all this because the southern coastal plains were home to Israel's enemies, their most bitter bitter enemies, <laughs> the Philistines, throughout most of the Old Testament period. So uh, the greatest concentration of Philistines occupied that same plain. So uh, from the period of the judges, that we'll get to later, from the period of the judges, 
to David's rise to the throne, the Philistines uh, fought off and on with the Israelites. So, and they were the southern part, mm -hmm. the, the southern coastal plain of Syria, Palestine. <clears throat> As a matter of fact, it's uh, the, the Philistines. The, eventually, their name was changed to Palestinians. So basically, the Palestinians that you hear of are the Philistines from the Bible. Oh, so the Philistines basically became Palestinians. Mm -hmm. So, even though Adam was the first man, it was after the fall and the flood before God chose Abraham. You know, to uh, he made the blood covenant with Abraham and uh, he prophesied to Abraham that the Messiah would come through his offspring. So, like we talked about Jesus being in the first part of Genesis, he's also, when he's talking, when God's talking to Abraham, when he says that uh, uh, through your offspring, everyone will be blessed, he's talking about the Messiah coming through his offspring. So, he's considered to be our founding patriarch because that's kind of where everything all started from there you know um, and Father Abraham had many sons <laughs> many sons yeah. Father Abraham. that was beautiful <laughs> <laughs> thank you thank you and so um, we won't we won't get in all the flood and stuff right now we'll get into it more when we get into Genesis but there is something interesting that you know when we think about the flood we think about the biblical account of the flood but there were also back then a lot of other countries and places that also tell the flood story so there were um, Polynesia Tibet Kashmir Lithuania Australia the Greeks India all of them had flood stories oh, so wow mm-hmm this was after the flood that they had flood stories. After people slapped her with <laughs> Everybody died, but yet these people lived to tell. <laughs> no, the people that came back, I mean, eventually the world repopulated and these people all had flood stories. So. But they weren't there. I'm clarifying that. Okay. So. <laughs> Um, and then there were also, Abraham was, uh, the Bible says that he came from Ur, U-R, Ur of the Chaldees. And that there have been excavations in uh, 1915, there were excavations in Meso Mesopotamia that uh, revealed what was believed to be that biblical city, Ur. And it was, uh, they believe that it was a powerful, prosperous, colorful, and powerful capital city at the beginning of the second millennium BC. And then this is uh, gonna have a blank. Although we can't know for sure what the precise dates were for Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, Jacob Israel's patriarchs, <laughs> they can be placed generally between 2000 and 1550 BC. What? 2000 to 1550 BC. And the, also the, the periods before and after the flood, directly before and after, don't have complete genealogies. You know, it'll say some of the sons of so-and-so, you know, and given some genealogies, but they're not including everybody, you know, because there'd just be too much to fit in a book if they included all the information. You know, God, um, God includes in the Bible all the information that's relevant to his purpose and his plan and everything. <laughs> I brought them on camera last time. <laughs> what? They're saying bring y'all on camera. Us? Yeah. Say hi. Hi. <laughs> I've got escapees now. <laughs> <laughs> My son's trying to jump on the oh. <laughs> um, God told Abram to take his family and leave his home. He was living in Ur and told him to pick up his family and leave and go to the land that he would show him. And uh, so, um, 
but in Ur was in the southern Mesopotamia, Mesopotamia area. I'm giving up on talking. And uh, <laughs> to travel to unknown lands. And so he acted on faith, and he packed up his belongings and his family and everything to go where God sent him. So, and during the during these times, that they were people were more of nomadic people. They, you know, they would have tents. You know, that some of them would be more round tents, and then some of them would be more like oblong, you know, flat and oblong or whatever. But that's what they lived in, and then that way. Um, they could pick up and leave if they needed to. You know, like if they're if this place is not thriving anymore and they don't have enough food or things are not going however, you know, then they can pack up and move to some place that's a little bit more bountiful and has more uh, more sustainable for their lives. And so he just packed up his tent and, and went, huh, packed up his tent. <laughs> and then uh, it kind of sounds like, never mind, Ray Stevens. I was just <laughs> Into the tent he went. But, um, and then also that they, they could pretty much uh, fit all their belongings like on a pack on a donkey. So they didn't, they didn't have a bunch of material things back then. They just had their necessities. Um, I already said that. And then, but sheiks, people that were considered to have a lot of money, they would have like, instead of having one big tent or something, they'd have several tents, you know. Several donkeys to pack them on. <laughs> um, a tent in the Old Testament is often a reference to any habitation so that they could pack up and move when necessary. So, um, RV. yeah, if they had an RV back then, it would have been a tent. When Abraham uh, reached Canaan, God made a covenant with him, like I just mentioned before, and promised to give him a vast number of descendants. And Canaan would be his inheritance, and Canaan ended up being Israel and Jerusalem and all that stuff. And then um, after many years, Isaac was born. When Sarah was 90, and Abraham was 100. And then God spoke, like I mentioned a while ago, spoke prophetically of the coming Messiah in Genesis 22:18, when he told Abraham, And through your offspring, all nations on earth will be blessed, because you have obeyed me. So he's talking about the coming of the Messiah. So um, that's just one other place where he's mentioned, and you'll discover when we start getting through all of this that Jesus is everywhere in the Old Testament. And he's referred to in every single book. You know, so that's why I told y'all before the whole Old Testament points to the New Testament. Um, Isaac's. Isaac's wife, Rebecca, had twin sons. I don't know if I said this or not. I guess I did. Now we're just going through, we're just kind of going through the basic summary of the Old Testament real quick. So that's why I'm going through. <laughs> that's why I'm talking about all these people because we're just kind of going to quickly cover the basics of what the Old Testament is. And then next week we'll get into Genesis. But um, Isaac's wife... Rebecca had twin sons, Jacob and Esau. And um, Esau was the oldest, but Jacob became the child of promises. And Jacob, whose name was changed to Israel, had 12 sons. And that's a blank. I think you have that one. Had 12 sons? Yeah. His name was changed to Israel, and he had 12 sons. And Jacob, we were talking today about the, the rapture of the church, and Jacob's name was changed to Israel, and the tribulation is uh, called the time of Jacob's trouble. And Jacob is Israel, so time of Israel's trouble. Get this cut out of here. <laughs> I know, I mean. <laughs> of course, you know that it says in the Old Testament that uh, Jacob's, that Joseph was Jacob's favorite son. Oh. I know, he had a favorite son. And um, that his other, his, all of his brothers his, were jealous of him. So they started out to kill him. 
but I think it was his brother Reuben that felt guilty um, about killing him because they were just going to throw him in a well and just leave him to die because <laughs> they were so jealous of him and they hated him. And uh, but they ended up getting him out of the well and selling him into slavery. And so, but that was all part of God's plan because they the yes, Joseph and his Technicolor Dreamcoat. They uh, sold him into slavery, and then he ended up. Um, Joseph could um, tell what dreams meant. You know, he uh, God gave him that gift, and he ended up being able to tell somebody their dream while they were in prison, what it meant, and and then uh, and then told them to tell the Pharaoh, but um, they forgot. You know, when they got back in Pharaoh's service, and then uh, and then Pharaoh had uh, had a dream about the famine, the coming famine, but he had no idea what his dreams meant. So that guy was like, oh yeah, there's this guy that I saw in jail that can tell you what your dreams mean. <laughs> and so they called Joseph and Joseph came and told him what his dreams meant and everything. And then um, he was promoted to like the second in command of uh, the Pharaoh. There's a lot of story in between there, but I'm skipping all that because we'll get into that when we get into that story. But um, and then, and then there was a severe drought, and his brothers ended up having to come to him <laughs> to ask for food. Oh, how the tables turned. Yeah, but they didn't know it was him. They didn't recognize him because he was all glorious and everything being uh, second in command to him. But uh, it's believed that the general time of these events were uh, in the Middle Bronze Age, all still in that time period from... 2000 to 1550. That all kind of took place in the same time frame. And then uh, and then eventually the, because all the all the people in Israel ended up having to go to Egypt because of the famine and everything and the food was all in Egypt. And so they came they ended up migrating. Joseph migrated his family and all of them to Egypt and then time went by you know, Joseph was dead, all this time went by, and then the Pharaohs forgot about Joseph, forgot about all this stuff that had happened, and then they ended up enslaving the Israelites, you know, and, and using them to uh, build their stuff for all their commerce and all that kind of stuff. And um, so that's when the, well, the Egyptians entered into the period of their greatest political strength, a new kingdom. And so, uh, Egypt, this is a blank, Egypt was dominant during the late Bronze Age. And its powerful rulers attempted to control the coastal area of Syria, Palestine. They dominated all the trade, then they had tremendous wealth, and they had, of course, Israel's the slaves doing everything for them. You know, and then, um, what blanks are you missing? Yeah, so Abraham came onto the scene in the blank, and then the other one I'm missing is that it is believed that the general time of the events of Joseph taking place was in the middle Bronze Age around. Would that be the same? Yeah. Would that be the 2000 to 15? To 1550, 15, 15, yeah. 15, okay. I just didn't And Abraham came onto the scene in the middle Bronze Age. So in the end of the late Bronze Age, the Hittite king and the Egyptian pharaoh Ramses II agreed to a peace treaty. Sometime during the late Bronze Age, while Israel was suffering under the burden of slavery in Egypt, this is a blank, Moses was born to the tribe of Levi. The Levites were the priests. How do you spell that? L-E-V-I. L -E -V -I. So, when Moses was born, do y'all know why that they were killing the babies? Did y'all know that they were killing the babies? Yes, the they didn't babies? want the, the Hebrews to become dominant over their culture. Yeah, they, they were afraid that they would over. be too many of them, mm -hmm. and so they decided to kill all the baby boys, mm -hmm. you know. And then uh, Moses was born, and then his mom put him in the basket in the Nile River, and and the Pharaoh princess found him. Pharaoh princess? No. 
know what I mean? Um, so he was obviously uh, saved by Pharaoh's daughter, and he was raised in the Egyptian royal court and given the finest Egyptian education. And even though the movies act like that he didn't know, you know, he found out as he was an adult that he was a Hebrew, he knew. You know, he was raised in there, but he knew who he was, mm -hmm. his heritage and everything. It was his mom that became, that was his nurse. Yeah, they asked him, uh, mm -hmm. his sister asked uh, the Pharaoh's daughter if she needed a, a nursemaid or whatever for the baby, and she said, yeah, so his own mother actually came and uh, was his nurse, his, his nanny. <laughs> so she told him he was Hebrew? Him yeah, he knew he was Hebrew, yeah. She told him about who they were and who mm -hmm. he was. Yeah, yeah, that's right. Um, <laughs> so God called Moses to deliver Israel from Egypt and bring them to the Sinai Peninsula to establish the covenant with them, give them the Ten Commandments and all that. And then the new nation of Israel rejected God's leadership in the wilderness, you know, and so he let them wander in the wilderness for 40 years. You know, and at that time, most of the people who rebelled and everything died out during that time. And then uh, he also died before getting to enter the promised land. But um, And then Joshua was his successor, and he led uh, the nation of Israel uh, in conquest of the promised land. And uh, so he fulfilled the prophecies to the patriarchs of getting to go to the promised land. And... Uh, the Israelite exodus occurred during the New Kingdom period of Egyptian history. I don't know if I even put a blank or if I just told you. Uh, scholars have proposed a couple of possible dates for the exodus, which would have been either 1446 or 1275 B.C. They kind of lean towards the, the 1275, I think, because that's when Ramses, you know, they in the movies and everything, they always have Ramses II. You know, as the Why is it Pharaoh. Such a broad two hundred year. I guess just yeah. because because there's such a broad all the way through about some things that you know later on things the dates tighten up you know and you know when things are but early on like that some of them were just a little bit less. Well, the hard part sure. too is it's like when you're learning about history and geology they have different methods of learning that like way back when they would do carbon dating. Right. and try to where that's where we get the whole oh it happened billions and billions of years ago but now they're starting to and this was historically told by a professor of mine that they're trying a different set of being able to time date mm -hmm. things and the time dating that they're doing now is starting to mirror that of biblical times mm -hmm. so that might be why because it's not a set you know oh hey Mm -hmm. And plus, the Hebrew calendar is different than. Uh, yeah. So you have. Yeah, they don't have as many days mm -hmm. in a year as we do. Um. So, I already said that. So the Pharaoh would have either been Tutmos, <laughs> Tutmos the third, <laughs> or Ramses the <II>. second. <laughs> and so, like I said, they they think that it's probably Ramses. And then uh, around 1200 BC, the major powers were the Egyptians and the Hittites, and they started declining. And then um, they think that these times started actually with the fall of Troy. You know, so it's neat because all these little things that you know a little something about, you know, and then you hear about it in connection with biblical history, you know, which would have been around 1250 BC. And, uh, then uh, there was a fall of the Mycenaean cities on the mainland of Greece. And then the survivors would have fled uh, by the sea along the Mediterranean coast. And, and these people were called Sea Peoples. And uh, one of the groups of these Sea Peoples were known from Egyptian sources as Peleset and settled on the southwest coastal plains of Syria, Palestine. And they were known in the Old Testament as Philistines term of the Roman modified word Palestine. And they had the Philistines, you know, they kind of had the upper hand for a while there because they were 
um, they kind of monopolized. <laughs> That's a lot different than monopolized. <laughs> um, the use of iron. So it says uh, in the Bible, it says uh, they had the metalworking technology and monopoly of the use of iron. First Samuel thirteen nineteen through twenty two says not a blacksmith could be found in the whole land of Israel, because the Philistines had said. Otherwise, the Hebrews will make swords or spears. So they made sure that they didn't let them get their technology and use their technology because they didn't want them to be able to develop these weapons and use them in battle against them. So it says, um, this is still part of the scripture, so all Israel went down to the Philistines to have their plow joints, mattocks, axes, and sickle sharpened. So they, you know, they're not weapons, but they're tools. And uh, so on the day of the battle, not a soldier with Saul and Jonathan had a sword or spear in his hand. Only Saul and his son Jonathan had them. <laughs> oh. And that's all in Samuel. Wow. Well, mm -hmm. So iron uh, technology had replaced bronze. And so, and I've already said this, I think archaeologists refer to the period after 1200 B.C. as the Iron Age. That's when Iron Man was born. No. <laughs> <laughs> And then uh, somewhere near the end of the Bronze Age, Joshua and the children of Israel had taken Canaan, 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 and settled in the central highlands. And then uh, for a couple centuries after that, then Israel, uh, they consisted of the 12 tribes from Jacob's 12 sons, one tribe for each son. And during this time, a leadership of judges rose up, you know, because in the Bible it talks about judges from the common people on a temporary basis just for particular purposes, you know, so uh, mainly just when they had issues that they needed to resolve, things that were going on and they needed a judge, then they had these judges. Uh, these judges were divinely gifted and ordained to con consolidate the strength and resources of the tribes in times of national or regional crisis, such as military threats and whatever. Eventually, uh, the Israelites got tired of uh, constant military threats from their enemies and they started wanting a king. You know, other other countries around them had kings and stuff, but they didn't because God was their king. You know, so uh, he didn't feel like that they needed one because they could ask him. They could come to him with any issues that they had. But it was because, this is your blank, it was because of this constant threat of military invasion and the cultural pressure to become like other nations that had kings mm -hmm. that drove them to ask for a king. Mm, so look, you want to be like the Joneses. Yeah, we want to be like other places that have a king. And um, and it, God was not happy about it, you know, because I think he felt a little bit dejected, betrayed, <laughs> or whatever, you know, by his people. Because I'm not enough. Yeah, I'm not enough. Yeah, they want somebody besides me to be their king. And then Samuel was a prophet and a judge. Oh, that's a blank. Who led Israel in a time of transitioning from the judges to kings. You know, Samuel's the one that anointed David. Uh, but he anointed Saul as the first king of Israel. You know, God picked Saul and he chose Saul. But uh, Saul didn't stay. I think Saul let things go to his head and he didn't follow what God wanted him to do. And um, Saul lived in fear. He didn't want to. He wanted to like run away and let people do whatever. Yeah. It says he he failed to stay in relationship with God, and eventually he was rejected as the king of Israel. So God instructed Samuel to anoint a man after his own heart, and David was anointed as the next king. And under David's leadership, Israel defeated the Philistines. And they had a pretty good degree of uh, peace and security in Syria, Palestine. And uh, this was considered, David's kingdom brought in a period of stability that was considered to be Israel's golden age. The best time was during, during that. David uh, brought, already said that, he, knew, he unified the tribes, the 12 tribes, and provided economic and political freedom and there was, even though there was internal strife during his reign, he was able to leave a unified kingdom to Solomon, his son. And this began the dynastic, dynastic 
succession in ancient Israel. So in Solomon, you know, he expanded Israel's borders and to the north and to Egypt, to the south. And uh, he, when Solomon ruled Israel, it was considered, the only time it was ever considered to actually be an empire. You know, he had a whole lot of area. He had a whole lot of wives. A whole lot of, <laughs> but, you know, a lot of them were politically done, you know. And um, anyway, we'll get into more than that. But he brought a lot of international trade and wealth and prosperity. And so, and he asked God for wisdom, and God gave him wisdom. And he uh, used his wisdom except falling out of relationship with God. You know, he God purposely told them not to marry outside of their faith, basically. You know, and uh, that was because that so many other uh, uh, nations and everybody worshipped idols and different types of gods. So he said, don't marry outside of that because you have a tendency to accept what they have or follow what they have and that's why he did. He married women and uh, he ended up worshiping some of the idols and stuff that they did. But um, <clears throat> he gained worldwide fame as an inspiring leader and he was also, uh, he's the one that got to build God's temple. You know, David had too much blood on his hands from too many wars and everything and so God chose to wait and have Solomon build the temple. And the reigns of David and Solomon were known as the United Monarchy. You, you tricked us. <laughs> <laughs> I saw you all over there writing it out. They're filling in the wrong blank. Or filling the wrong thing of the blank. The United Monarchy. We all put gold in <laughs> <laughs> At least everybody got it wrong. <laughs> And the United Monarchy was remembered as being the ideal time of peace and prosperity. It says in 1 Kings 4.25. But um, Solomon also let his heart turn away from God. And 1 Kings 11.4 says that his heart was not fully devoted to the Lord, his God, as the heart of David, his father, had been. Oh. Why don't y'all go back outside? <laughs> Shortly after Solomon's death, the kingdom split into two weaker kingdoms, being Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And this was known as the divided monarchy. That's a blank. The kingdoms were divided. And they ended up going into two separate... You know, when the Israelites went into captivity, they actually went to two different places depending on Israel and Judah. Judah is the one that we follow. You know, because Jesus came from the tribe of Judah. Uh, northern Israel fell into religious apostasy as the first king of Israel in the north, Jeroboam the uh, first, tried to use religion and political for political purposes and compromised the practices of Yahwehism that were passed down from Moses. Uh, then a later king, Omri, and his son Ahab, and his wicked wife Jezebel, intentionally combined Mosaic Yahwehism with Canaanite Baalism in an attempt to gain more political control. You know, because if you are all-encompassing, like a lot of things are these days, yep. you know, you can get more followers. <laughs> more votes. Yeah, more votes, that too, yeah. So, uh, this is a blank. Over the 200 years of its history, from 931 to 722 BC, Israel had 19 kings in nine separate dynasties. In 722 BC, the capital of northern Israel, Samaria, fell to the Assyrians. We're fighting over the phone. Um, in contrast, Judah, the southern kingdom, continued to have one royal family because God kept that line. You know, he always kept a remnant from the tribe of Judah, you know, to so that he could eventually bring the Messiah through through that line. So um, the line of David's dynastic family uh, for 350 years. Judah continued to have political stability, but also gradually fell into religious apostasy. 
You know, this happened all throughout the Old Testament. Oh. That's why the Old Testament is so long. <laughs> Many of the kings of Judah were faithful to the Lord, especially early in the kingdom's history. But the final century of Judah's history is marked by interchanging good kings and bad kings. You know, you'd have like one that would be he turned to the Lord and uh, reinstate the worship and the sacrifices and all this kind of stuff, you know. And then the next king would be worshiping other gods and turn away from God, you know. So it was like back and forth kind of there for a while. Um, so, due to the all of that happening, it says Judah's capital, Jerusalem, fell to the Babylonians in 587 B.C. The uh, time period of 930 to 539 B.C. covers Israel's divided kingdoms of northern Israel and southern Judah. And it's what some archaeologists, archaeologists, <laughs> archaeologists, you know what I'm saying? Archaeologists <laughs> call the Iron Age too, and that's where they got the movie Iron Man too. No, <laughs> I'm just kidding. Um, also, during this time, Egypt was trying to become a major world power again, but uh, except for a very short time, they never became a major world power again uh, during the ancient world. During Iron Man 2, no, I'm just kidding. But during Iron Age 2, Assyrian imperialism emerged in the mid 9th century, which uh, impacted the politics of Syria Palestine. So there were long and prosperous reigns for Jeroboam II in Israel and Uzziah in Judah. Remember, Israel and Judah are northern kingdom, southern kingdom. Um, but even though they prospered, there was a lot of social injustice and moral decay just kept on growing and getting worse. And uh, and the people, their hearts were just turning away from God. So this was when one of the first of the classical prophets, Amos, that has Amos, Hosea, Isaiah, and Micah all came onto the scene. So God was raising up his servants to warn the nations of impending doom and call them to repentance. And you'll notice when we're going through these books that that's like the theme <laughs> that goes through a lot of them. And that's where you'll see Jesus too because they're turning away from God and God is telling them, you know, if you don't change your ways, if you don't turn back to me, then you're going to go through all this stuff. And he would do different things, you know. He'd give them droughts. He'd give them different things to try to get their attention to get them to turn back to him. But, you know, they just weren't doing it. And um, so... But usually he would tell them, this is all going to happen if you do this, but there will be one who comes, you know, to redeem all this, you know. So you'll see it almost in every book, you know, that things are going to go bad if you don't change, but the Messiah is going to come, you know, eventually, and everything will get <laughs> Children. Um, so... During the next century, uh, Judah attempted ways of dealing with the Assyrian threat, and Hezekiah was the king of Judah, and he kept them at bay, but his son Manasseh was doing witchcraft and took the easier approach and adopted a pro-Assyrian policy. So during the 7th century, Assyria became the first truly world empire. A-S-S-Y-R-I-A. Um, they soon became independent and re uh, oh, well, I'll skip something however closer to home the Chaldeans of northern Babylonia were becoming rebellious and hard to contain and they soon became independent and replaced the Assyrians and then this is a blank under the rulership of Nabo Pulassar Nabo <laughs> Polisar <laughs> and his famous son Nebuchadnezzar II Babylon participated in defeating Assyria and became the next world power Jonah, Obadiah and Nahum were prominent prophets during this time and one of the things I'll learn too is you know you read about this prophet telling all these things and then this prophet all this and some of them existed at the same time 
you know, possibly even knew each other. <laughs> so I thought that was kind of cool. And, um, but I don't remember which one, so I'll tell you that later. Um, during the 43-year reign of Nebuchadnezzar, Babylonia reached the peak of its wealth and political power, which was considered the Neo-Babylonian period. Um, let me skip some of this so y'all don't just die of boredom. Um, the final archaeological age of the Old Testament time period is known as the Persian Age, which is from 539 to 332 B.C., and is also known as Iron Age III. The reign of the Persian king Cyrus marks the beginning of the Persian Empire. This was one of the largest kingdoms in the ancient world. The Persian Empire controlled the ancient world for two centuries until Alexander the Great conquered the Persians around 330 BC and put an end to the string of world empires from a Mesopotamian base. King Cyrus felt he could maintain and govern his empire better with a policy of tolerance, doing good to others rather than cruelty, and the Jewish exile in Babylonia officially ended when Cyrus decreed that the captive people were free to return to their homelands. So Cyrus was the one who let the Israelis go back to Israel. And um, God had prophesied about this and he actually named Cyrus in his prophecy. So uh, when Daniel brought that prophecy to Cyrus, that was very, I mean, that was very uh, influential on him, had a big impact on him. <laughs> he knew God was talking to him, you know, and, uh, and so he let him go. So um, this, the Old Testament interprets this historical event as the fulfillment of the prophecy of Jeremiah in Second Chronicles. So we'll look that up when the time comes, but uh, that's where the prophecy was that named Cyrus as the king. Mm -hmm. In Second Chronicles 36, 22, and 23, and Ezra 1, 1 through 4. I'm not sure uh, which one or both, but I found both of them. Over the next century, three separate groups of Jewish exiles went back to Jerusalem to begin rebuilding. The first group was under the leadership of Zerubbabel and the leadership of the high priest Jeshua. Um, they tried to rebuild the temple but had to deal with opposition. And then it was after the prophets Haggai and Zechariah that the second temple was finally finished in 516 B.C. And then that temple was there until 70 A.D. when it was destroyed by Rome. Um, Ezra, the priest and scribe, led the second group from Babylonia in 458 B.C., and um, Nehemiah led the third group in Jer to Jerusalem in 445 B.C. And uh, he had risen high to office in the Persian royal court. And his task was one of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem for better defense of its inhabitants. As a matter of fact, it says that uh, he had a hammer in one hand and a sword in the other, you know, while they were trying to build and be able to defend at the same time. Um, Nehemiah stayed in Jerusalem after the wall was completed as the governor of the Persian province. The Old Testament ends with God's people restored and a new temple built for proper worship. However, this wasn't a kingdom of God with the son of David on the throne. The promises of God's sacred covenant would have to wait. The Old Testament ends with expression and faith that God will fulfill his purposes in his own time and in his own way. So, what time is it? Uh, what time is it? I have no idea. I don't have my phone. Um, it's 818. 818. Do y'all want to stop for discussion? Or do you want to keep going? <laughs> I have something really cool to show y'all. That um, y'all can stick this in your little book. <laughs> These are ancient writings. It has the word king in various scripts. 
So the first one is the word king in Sumerian script and their cuneiform, you know, where they wrote on the tablets. The second one is the word king in Egyptian hieroglyphics. 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 Uh, the third one is the word king in the Iron Age Hebrew script. And the last one is the word king in Neo-Assyrian Arcadian script. Wow. What? Oh. Never mind. Okay, I guess we'll just stop there, and uh, do y'all have anything that stands out to you or anything from what you learned tonight? I'm always trying to get that straight with all the talk about the uh, system with the Palestinians, Israel, you know, all of that, because I'm not as versed in that history as I should be. So, that's Well, Goliath was a Philistine, you know, mm -hmm. and so when they were... Uh, they were constantly fighting the Philistines. Uh, Samson fought the Philistines. You know, so they were pretty dominant back in those days. You like one of them? Yeah. Mm -hmm. I like the water and the Anything stand out? Anything you didn't know that is exciting that you learned? Pretty much a lot of that. <laughs> I think it's awesome when you can find ways where in the Bible and be able to discover matching it with real time yeah. stuff. That's why I don't miss a thing. Stop. That, <laughs> that's why um, I thought it's so cool, you know, that it mentions Troy, mm -hmm. you know, and just um, Alexander, the Alexander the Great, you know, things that kind of, that we already are a little bit familiar oh, with great. from the, mm -hmm. the world that fit with the scripture. Are we and, done now? No, and kind of cool about. Um, Abraham, you know, being able to find Abraham. time frames kind of for yeah. all of the stuff to make it kind of fit in, tie in, make more sense, and the Iron Age and the Bronze Age and all that. And even though it should be obvious why it's Iron Age and Bronze Age, I didn't know that. You know, but um, I just thought Iron Man. <laughs> <laughs> but um, anyway, any questions, comments? Well, we can I pray know. then. I, gotta sit. I know you'll be asking me more. <laughs> I'll be getting like forty thousand questions. I have to just let it sit for That's okay. You gotta let it sit and simmer, and then you can think about what you need to ask. Okay. Anybody on here have any questions or comments? <laughs> okay. Well, let's pray. Lord, we thank you for this time that we got to spend together to study your word, Lord, and to learn more about you and learn more about the Bible and surrounding events, Lord. And we just pray, God, that you would continue to be with us, continue to help us to understand. And even after we leave here, like Ryan was saying, let some stuff sit, you know, let it sink in a little bit more and, and help us to uh, keep it in our minds and in our hearts. And Lord, we just pray that you go with each one tonight, Lord. And, um, we just love you, and we give you all the praise and all the glory. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. We'll see you all next time. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> or we may see you this time. <laughs> Bye. Yay. <laughs> I don't know who it is. I don't know who the baby that is. Yeah. Probably moms. What's the, I mean, Brian, go get him. <laughs> okay. Never mind. Yeah. Yes. He's getting quick at it, too. <laughs>